Welcome back to our teaching series, The Way of Jesus. This is week two. And last week we kicked things off by looking at what it means to be a follower of Jesus or his disciple. And we said that being a disciple was different from being a student because it involves all of us. Not just our head, but our hands and our heart and our feet as well. Every part of us. When Jesus said, follow me and come and see, people didn't just sign up for a six week course taught over Zoom. They actually left their homes and families, their jobs and their security in order to learn the way of Jesus, which should tell us something about the impact that being a follower of Jesus is going to have on every single area of our lives. We may not need to physically leave our homes or families, but What is certain is that the way of Jesus is going to cause us to rethink everything, every thought, every action, every decision and every relationship will be challenged. And it's our relationships that I want to spend a bit of time thinking about today, because Jesus had quite a bit to say about our relationships with each other. He said to his disciples, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another, adding by this. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if if you love one another. The way that we love each other, then, is the very thing that sets us apart as followers of Jesus. It's not our political affiliation or our theological position or our rules or rituals or anything else. It's the way that we show love. Jesus said, didn't he love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind? This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. And he added that the law and the prophets, they all hang on these two commandments. When Jesus was accused of breaking the law by the religious leaders, it was because he was acting in love. He was doing things like healing on the Sabbath or touching those afflicted with leprosy or speaking to women or eating with tax collectors and sinners or forgiving people in public. These were all things that were considered against the law. But Jesus demonstrated time and time again that love came first. And so if we're going to be followers of Jesus way, we have to begin with love. And to do that, we have to ask, what does this love look like in our relationships with each other? If you have a Bible with you, I'm going to be reading mainly from 1 Corinthians 13 today. And if you've ever been to a wedding, um, there's a strong chance that you'll have heard this verse read aloud, which is sort of ironic because Paul believed that it was better for people not to get married. But anyway, today I want to use these words as a framework to help us think about the kind of love that Jesus demonstrates. Inspired by Jesus, Paul writes these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. Last week, I made the point that Jesus, unlike other teachers of his day, went out of his way and chose his disciples for himself. He didn't wait for some bright, young, eager thing who was keen to learn to approach him. No, no, he went and handpicked his followers. And the people that he chose were not really who you would have expected. They were a bit messy and at times a bit emotional, often confused. You know, the the sort of people that would really try your patience. You had uh, Peter, who was constantly putting his foot in it, always saying the first thing that came into his head. And then his younger brother, Andrew, who used to be a disciple of John the Baptist. And then you had James and John, another pair of brothers who had big ambitions. They were always trying to push their way to the top. Jesus gave them the nickname Sons of Thunder. Philip, who was so keen that he asked Jesus to show him God. And Nathan, who was a bit of a sceptic and didn't believe that anything good could come out of Nazareth. You had Matthew, who was a tax collector working for Rome and 
Simon, who was looking for a way to violently overthrow Rome. So not an ideal pairing there. Thomas, who had his doubts. James and Jude, who I assume were introverts because there's hardly anything written about them. Sort of imagine them quietly rocking in the corner. And of course, Judas, who turned out to be a bit greedy, shall we say. And these were Jesus' disciples, hand-picked by him. <laughs> Certainly not who I'd have chosen, let me tell you. I mean, if Jesus had asked me who he should choose, I'd have told him, well, you know, you, you need people with good interpersonal skills, Jesus. You need team players. You need people that you can depend upon. You need people that are mature, people that are, are flexible with a strong work ethic, not this motley crew of misfits and malcontents. And they really were a pain. I don't know if you've ever noticed just how many times in the Gospels Jesus needs to have a word. In Mark 4, after calming the storm, he says, why were you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? In Mark 8, 33, he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the concerns of God. In Mark 9, 19, when the disciples struggle to heal a small boy, he says to them, you unbelieving generation. Oh, how long shall I put up with you? How long shall I stay with you? In Mark 9, 33, Jesus turns around and says, what were you arguing about hmm? on the road? And my all time favourite in Luke 9, 54, James and John, they offer to call down fire from heaven to destroy a village. And it says, Jesus turned around and he rebuked them doesn't tell us what he said but i sort of imagine he gave him a look and sort of shook his head in disappointment because you know it's it's always worse when you disappoint someone isn't it yet despite all of that jesus love remained patient and kind for every failure there was a chance to start again for every word said in rebuke there was an encouragement or an explanation he never gave up on them he never walked away from them or kicked them off the team you know even with judas had he changed his mind or repented i'm convinced that jesus would have welcomed him back with open arms because his patience and his kindness were endless I wish my patience and kindness were endless. I have two children who test my patience and kindness daily. And, you know, if I'm being completely honest with you, sometimes my patience runs out. Sometimes I say things that aren't kind, things that I regret later on. I'm not Jesus. But if we're going to learn to love like Jesus, patience and kindness need to be our highest priority. Do we make enough allowances for each other? Are the words that we use kind and gentle, given to restore and, and, and redeem, or are they harsh and cruel, given to tear down and destroy? Do we perhaps sometimes let our emotions get the best of us? Paul continues, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, before he selected his disciples, he came to see John the Baptist in order to be baptised. And baptism was a, a symbol of repentance, of turning away from past mistakes or sins to be washed clean and start again. And John, knowing who Jesus was, he tried to deter him, saying, no, 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 I need to be baptised by you. Why are you coming to me? But Jesus replied, let it be so now, for it's proper for us to do this in order to fulfill all righteousness. And John consented. But the question remains, if Jesus was sinless, perfect in every way, then why did he need to be baptised? The simple answer is he didn't. But I think he did it because he wanted to identify with us. He did it as a way of saying, I'm here with you in your brokenness and shame. The Apostle Paul would later comment that Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But rather he made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a servant and, and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
I think Jesus wanted to show us that love and humility go hand in hand. And if we want to learn the way of Jesus, we can't do it by placing ourselves above others. One of the greatest examples of Jesus' humility was seen during the Last Supper, when Jesus got onto his hands and his knees and he washed the feet of his disciples. He cleaned the dirt from between their toes, every single one of them, Judas included. And he said to them, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. The trouble is, most of the time, we're not all that keen on making ourselves less, are we? I think we'd much rather think of ourselves as superior, even if we don't admit that in public. And there's lots of ways that we make ourselves superior. Sometimes it's like um, an intellectual superiority. Oh, I know better than them. You know, it really breaks my heart that I've seen so much of this in Christian circles of late, particularly online. I see people just arguing each other under the table, claiming that their way is the only way or the way it's always been, as though there haven't been 2000 years of disagreement and division already in the Christian church. I want to say something a little bit controversial now and if it offends you please write to me or or speak to me in church and I'll apologize to you in person but a lot of what we believe about the bible it's not actually that important i don't think it matters too much if you believe in a a literal six day creation or not or that if you think of a particular bible story is true or or metaphorical I think the question we should be asking is, how is what I believe helping me to love the person in front of me well? How well am I doing at building a a relationship and a community with people that don't look or think exactly as I do? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. That's how he loved. I heard a rabbi say once that the difference between Jews and Christians is that Jews can spend all night arguing about scripture and leave arm in arm because it's not their understanding of the Bible that makes them Jewish. Christians, on the other hand, will have one disagreement and need to go their separate ways. And I think that's true. I think we're too attached to our own understanding and not attached enough to Jesus, who is the word of God. And the only one that saved us. Sometimes it's a moral superiority, isn't it? I'm not like them. No, I don't behave like that. Not anymore. We think we're suddenly immune from sin because, you know, we've been walking with Jesus for a little while. That's a really dangerous place to be. Jesus said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, but pay no attention to the plank in your own? Or as Paul would later reflect, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All, everyone, every single person that has lived or will ever live has sinned we're all in exactly the same boat as each other saved only by his grace we can never claim some moral superiority the only boast that we have is jesus i think it was christian author philip yancey who said christians get very angry towards other christians who sin differently to they do Sometimes we can act as though we're spiritually superior. Yeah, no, my faith is much stronger. I I pray a lot more. I attend church way more than they do. I think we make ourselves like that Pharisee in the story that Jesus told. We pray, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, and evildoers, and adulterers, or even this tax collector. We need to be careful that our love doesn't become envious boastful or proud but that it remains gentle and humble how good are we at being gentle and humble and if you're sitting there thinking you know what actually i am extremely humble then you might have some more work to do paul continues love does not dishonor others it is not self-seeking it's not easily angered it keeps no record of wrongs 
In the first century Jewish circles that Jesus moved in, status was everything. And not just social status, but spiritual status too. When it came to God, you were either considered clean or unclean. And that depended on all sorts of things, some of which that were uh, in your control, some of which that weren't. For example, uh, you were considered unclean if you had recently given birth to a child. I've seen it. It is a somewhat messy process. Um, if you had an infectious disease like COVID, if you had had recently had an unusual bodily discharge. I'm not going to explain that one to you. Use your imagination. Uh, if you touched a corpse for some reason or if you'd come into contact with anyone or anything that made you unclean. And if you want the full list, just spend some time in Leviticus. You'll have a blast. It, it's a riot, honestly. But Jesus attracted all sorts of unwanted attention because of the time that he spent with those that were considered unclean. Those others would have done their utmost to avoid. For example, after calling Matthew, Jesus was invited to dine at his house and uh, Matt's friends were some of these unclean folk. So when the Pharisees saw Jesus doing this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does he break bread with them, share food with them? Why does he touch them on the shoulder and, and laugh with them like their friends? Ew! Doesn't he know what they do? Does he know what they've done? Does he know what kind of people they are? Of course, Jesus knew exactly the type of people he was spending time with. And he said in response to the Pharisees, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Not that the religious leaders were righteous either. They just thought they were. But Jesus said to many of the people that he spent time with, your sins are forgiven because love keeps no record of wrongs. It does not dishonour others. It does not keep them at arm's length or push them away. And I could give you many other examples of Jesus paying honour to those that were deemed unworthy by others. Like um, the sinful woman that stood at Jesus' feet weeping and, and pouring perfume on them. The Pharisee that Jesus was with at the time said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and the kind of woman that she is. She's a sinner. But of course, Jesus knew. He just loved her anyway. It would have been very easy, you know, for, for Jesus to make himself look good in the eyes of others, to climb the ranks and get to a position where others were bowing down before him. But Jesus said, the son of man he did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Love is not self-seeking nor easily angered. Sure, Jesus got angry, but not easily and never at trivial matters. In fact, his anger was mostly directed at those who were not acting in love. What about us? How easily do we forgive? How easily do we let go of past hurt or if we've got a mental pocketbook filled with dirt on everyone are we able to look past the sin of others to love like Jesus Paul concludes his thoughts on love like this he says love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth it always protects always trusts always hopes always perseveres John 8, we read these words of Jesus. If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. And then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. On another occasion, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus wanted us to know that his way of living was the only way to find freedom from the things that ensnare us. In John 8, he continues, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. 
So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. As we learn the way of Jesus, as we begin to love him and love like him, we experience a freedom like never before. We discover a life worth living. And as I read these words of Paul this week, I could so easily see the way of Jesus in them. In fact, I think you could replace the word love in Paul's writing with the word Jesus and it would still hold true. Jesus is patient. He was patient with his disciples and he is patient with you too. Jesus is kind. He is gentle and humble in heart. Jesus does not envy. Instead, he made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a servant, he gave it all for you. Jesus does not boast. He is not proud. Rather, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus does not dishonour others. He lifts them up. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus is not self-seeking. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is not easily angered. Rather, he reserves his anger for those who forget the greatest commandment, love. Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. He sets us free. He forgives our debts and releases us from sin. Jesus does not delight in evil because he is the way, the truth and the life. He always protects us, always trusts us, always hopes for us and always perseveres because he is with us always through his spirit, which he gives to those who trust him. In the words of John, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us We ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is our challenge to love like Jesus, to learn his way. And as we read those words in 1 Corinthians 13, I would just challenge you to ask the Holy Spirit to show you where your love might need refining. Do you need a bit more patience with family and friends and colleagues? Do your words need to be a little bit kinder, perhaps a bit humbler? Do you need to be a little less easily angered to let go of past hurts? Do we need to love a bit more like Jesus? I want to finish this morning with a prayer. It's a prayer that I read online this week. And if you want, you can make it your prayer too. Lord, because love is patient, help me to be slow to judge, quick to listen, hesitant to criticise, but eager to encourage, remembering your endless patience with me. Lord, because love is kind, help my words to be gentle and my actions to be thoughtful. Remind me to smile, to say please and thank you, because those little things still mean so much. Lord, because love does not envy or boast and is not proud, help me to have a heart that is humble and sees the good in others. May I celebrate and appreciate all that I have and all that I am, as well as doing the same for those around me. Lord, because love is not rude or self-seeking. Help me to speak words that are easy on the ear and on the heart. When I am tempted to get wrapped up in my own little world, remind me there is a great big world out there full of needs and hurts. Lord, because love is not easily angered and keeps no record of wrongs, help me to forgive others as you have forgiven me. When I want to hold on to a grudge, gently help me release it so that I can reach out a hand of love instead. Lord, Because love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Help me to stand up for what is right and good. May I defend the defenceless and help the helpless. Show me how I can make a difference. Lord, because love always protects and always trusts. 
Help me to be a refuge for those around me. When the world outside is harsh and cold, may my heart be a place of acceptance and warmth. And finally, Lord, because love always perseveres, help my heart continually beat with love for you and others. Thank you for showing me what the word love really means. Amen.